And next up is a roundtable discussing a uh, dis discussion moderated by uh, John Medved, so I'm going to lead you up on stage again. And the topic is uh, what we are all obsessed with, and that is growth. And I'm sure that uh, the Israelis in the crowd share with all of us uh, the eagerness to um, sneak off the image of startup companies only to sell them later or early, the late, earlier than later. So John, we need you up here again, John. Oh, yeah. Uh, to moderate this uh, critical topic and to give us an inside look at how to successfully grow big, globally significant companies to, we have three entrepreneur investors who each have done it. So um, I'm going to call you up stage. Um, Eli Vortman is the co-founder and former CEO of Delta 3, the company voice over IP, the Israeli voice over IP company that reached over a billion dollars in value and eventually went public on NASDAQ. Uh, Ellie went on to be a successful career at the, as a VC with Jerusalem Venture Partners and Benchmark Capital and more recently got back into company building as the chairman of the Vrome and of Angel, two major Israeli startups, so please join us on stage. pillars of our industry on this uh, panel. Don Moran is one of the Israeli well-known serial entrepreneurs. Um, in 2006, he sold M-Systems, the inventor of the USB memory stick we all know and love to SunDisk for $1.6 billion. Since then, he's been starting companies like Modu, which was pioneered in modular cell phone, and then Comigo, which is doing interactive TV. He's now a prophilic, prophilic VC with Grow Ventures and has invested in over two dozen startups. So Dov, please join us on stage. Adak Sali brings us a unique perspective on a topic that was frequently challenging for Israeli companies until recently, building a consumer brand. Adak's incredible story from Australia where he took a health and wellness store from a small family operation to a 1.5 billion exit over the course of a decade. He has been covered in magazines and newspapers all over the world, so we're very excited to have you with us. last but not least, Eli, <laughs> Eli Fuchter's extraordinary experience building one of Israel's premier uh, semiconductor companies. EasyChip is one of the is one of perseverance and uh, dedication. Eli built EasyChip over the course of two decades, um, founding it after his work in the Shmone Matayim, a 2000 unit, and at the Technion. EasyChip grew to uh, help define Israel's contribution to the EarthNet and um, technology. Very recently announced it will be bought by Melanox for over $800 million. So please join us, and John, I'm leaving you with it. So if we could turn this into sort of a master class on how to build real value and companies that last, you couldn't have a better group of uh, people here. We have different kinds of companies represented, semiconductors, consumer products, um, people from overseas. And I'm going to start off with a question that I've always wondered about, which is, when did you know that this was going to be a really successful company? Was there a point in your journey where all of a sudden you said, holy whatever, uh, this is going to work? Ellie? So, so speaking about <clears throat> Vroom.com, which is uh, very briefly, it's not an advertisement, uh, the, uh, we're trying to build the Amazon of uh, secondhand cars in the U.S. And it was actually almost immediate, right? And uh, many people ask, you know, do you do a lot of research before you get into something? Or is it from the gut? Is it very much from the gut. When you see an industry that does $500 billion a year in revenue, um, hasn't changed in a very long time. As a disruptor, it seems obvious that uh, if we succeed, we'll build something very big, and that's, uh, that's what we set out to do, and it was clear within the first uh, few minutes of seeing the opportunity, which is amazing. Okay, uh, Doug, when did you know that M-Systems was gonna really take off? 
I didn't know until that. Uh, maybe you, you know when the check goes into and the, the money is in the bank, yes? But that's in, the, in, the, in the best case that you do a, a cash uh, deal and not a, a, a shares deal. Uh, but uh, really, in the last five years of existence, where well, we grew from $45 million to $1 billion sales, not value, sales. Uh, which meant a real kind of billion uh, still, every quarter, every quarter I passed, every quarter, despite the fact that last 22 quarters were profitable, growing, every quarter I had this fear that it's all going to collapse. <laughs> Wait, I want to ask a quick question. Have you had that fear? Collapse? Yeah. I Someone have. on the past? In the past, yeah. definitely. Got it? Excuse Did you ever fear the whole thing was going to collapse? Uh, yeah, we had that moment, but my shareholders, Dom, you sounded like one of my shareholders. <laughs> <laughs> the shareholders thought it was all going to collapse. Yeah, 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 for sure. I always had a belief, right? Ellie, you must have had several times. Collapsing? <laughs> my expertise. <laughs> okay, so, and that literally, Dom, stayed with you until the end. Until the end, after the end. <laughs> So we actually went to a, 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 not a cash deal, but a share deal. Uh, right. Sunny's cash shares, when they acquired us, were $48. It took about a, a year and a half for their share to go down to $6. That's right. They went from $6 to $100 million. Hundred dollars. They they went, they, and they were recently acquired for uh, the shares of $87 million. Yeah, $87. So that'll, that'll, that'll definitely give you some worries. Right. You started with a family business, right? And uh, small, and you just, just built it up over about two decades almost? Uh, one decade, one decade. Uh, the, the vitamins aren't that good. So the, the, the vitamins made it faster. So <laughs> you tell us, when, when did you figure out that this was a much bigger play than what your family had built until then? Uh, look, for, for me, like when coming into the industry, I just saw a great opportunity for a, a brand to position itself as a lifestyle brand rather than just a health brand. Everyone had positioned themselves as a, a functional health outcome. And we definitely did that as a business, but we were, everyone was doing the same thing. So the, the, to, to create a brand that people cared about and that was aspirational uh, was just immediately obvious to me. I mean, I come from making movies and working in entertainment, so. It was a pretty exciting place to be. Everyone wanted to ask about you know, what movie Craig uh, Pitt was going to be making or whatever. And then I got to Swiss and I said, I'm working at Swiss. And people would say, Do you work for the embassy? <laughs> so, how, how do you make a vitamin sexy? Exactly. Well, so how do you? Well, health is our most precious asset. So, we need to make sure that we do all we can to look after our health. And, so, and, and, and people have learned that uh, things. You know, that it's pretty sexy to be healthy. And so wellness is, is, is this movement that's happening globally and it happened to coincide with us positioning ourselves as a lifestyle brand, not only a health brand. So uh, aspiration was key and, and as a result, you know, we, we've, we've been the biggest in Australia and the biggest online sales into China and launched in the UK. It's a silver so, yeah. so Ellie, most people don't have a clue when you start talking about what you do, it's very network processors. I mean, we're talking good old-fashioned high, high tech, right? I mean, when, when you would try to present what you were doing to investors out in the broader public, how would you even begin to make it more simple so they understand what you were doing and follow your trajectory? Yeah, actually, I have no idea still what we are doing. <laughs> You're getting a lot of humility up here, guys. I mean, this is where it's supposed to be. No, but seriously, we, we in Egypt, we build processors, and uh, unlike the Intel processors that goes into PCs, we build processors for routers. So it's very simple. And what you need to do, you need to get the big router guys to buy the processors from you, and then, then you have that point that, that you know that you're going to be very successful. You had a couple of customers. I mean, you could probably count your potential customers on two hands, four hands maybe. Yeah, yeah when we started the company 16 years ago, there were like, I don't know, 25 network processor companies, including Intel and IBM and Motorola, and you just name it. And we were a tiny little startup, but we were able to build something that was unique, outstanding, super technology. And 16 years later, we are the only player in that market. So all the others actually exit the market, and every customer that is now using 
Merchant Silicon Network Processors use these chips. So, in order to get started and to build a company, you need money. And I just heard, by the way, a little conversation between Dove and Joel Merrillis, who is uh, one of our uh, team members, who's now actually got a title of uh, Chief Exit Officer. But you mentioned that Joel, when he was an investment banker, had raised $500 million. We are arguing whether like, this was 200 or 500. But it was a lot. It was hundreds of millions of dollars. So clearly, all of these companies must have had their growth fueled by investment. I'm not sure about Radix. I don't know for sure. We'll hear that in a second. And investors, first of all, they always love to take credit for the success, right? Whether it's my company and whatnot. We know that it's your company. Investors can be helpful. Okay, and some of you guys are investors and entrepreneurs too, so you know the, both sides of this. But so, how important were the investors in your success? How you know did they really help? Were they simply there? Were they a pain in the butt? I mean, how how, how did you feel about the investors in your companies, Ellie? Uh, it's, it's a, a tough, tough question, question given where we're sitting right now. There's a lot of investors in the room. Um, I'd probably position it a little differently, which is uh, they didn't hurt and they were somewhat helpful. But uh, fundamentally, companies are built by, uh, by great entrepreneurs and great teams, and um, I think it's great to have helping, helping investors as well. Well, uh, in my case, uh, the situation was I established my company and I had no investors. No one wanted to invest in me. Not because I look so ugly or so stupid, but because uh, it, the days I established the company, there were no VCs in Israel. They were simple. And then I raised money in 1993, $4 million. Yes, I raised $4 million in Nasdaq. I know that people are people ask me, you, the cost of raising the money was $4 million. They said, no, 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 that's what we raised in Nasdaq. Uh, and that was the, the investors. And we, we did a great secondary with John, John Mervis, and, uh, and others. And clearly, money is very important. You, it, there are miracles, and they probably are here. There are successful companies which were successful without money. But uh, even the smartest guy, even the most talented guy, even the great entrepreneur of the world needs money in order to build a large and successful company. Hold on. So, Radek, did you raise money or did you just bootstrap it the whole way and just get profitable? Uh, <laughs> no, not, not quite. That would be nice. We, we uh, flew very close to the sun probably three times. And, uh, and the, the, the third time... But you explain, explain what that means to everybody? Flying close to the sun means like... You, know, you don't want to fly close to the sun. <laughs> it's pretty hot. <laughs> so, um, so investors were really important to, to get us out of the third time we flew really close to the sun. And, um, but the, the key thing for us and, and the key differentiator that helped us get away from the sun fast enough into the safe zone uh, was, was culture. And culture is something that I see here in Israel as being something outstanding and I see as a, its point of difference and, and why our crowds are being so successful so far and why this tech sector is booming. Uh, there's a unique set of uh, ingredients that are coming together that, that stand out and, and creating differentiation. And that's been our disruptor for our business has been our culture. And our unique culture has enabled us to, to, to bound together and get through challenging circumstances. Any investor needs to share that vision. And for us, that third uh, stage of investor shared that vision and understood our culture and really connected with us and helped us optimise the situation. And so, so everybody talks about culture. With all due respect, we do here constantly. But how did you find your company's culture? I mean, what was Easy Chip's culture, Ellie? I mean, and was that important to you? How did you foster it? Was it team T-shirts, weekends, you know, beer Thursdays? I don't know. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, so talk to me about. I want to hear what you guys think about culture. I'll, I'll, I'll answer first about the uh, about the investors. I have a good answer for that. I have to answer. <laughs> When I found that Lenoptics 26 years ago, I remember a meeting with angel investors. After 20 minutes, I got 300 dollars. 
But if we have three dollars, we have the thousand. So we have the thousand. I thought we were those were all the old old days. No, 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 no. We have the thousand, and that's it. The company went public in two years. Each one got hundred dollars for every dollar they invested. Three hundred times their money. That's good. But, but they got only forty-nine percent of the company. And then in easy cheap, the same. We always so I like investors as long as long as they only have forty-nine. When you sold forty-nine percent of the company in the C round. In both, both cases? In the, the case of Lenoptics, the seed round was the only round. So you're talking about earlier. Yes, I'm talking about Talk to me about your next company. company. That's That's company. Well, I will. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the case of uh, EasyChip, EasyChip was uh, actually a daughter company of Lenoptics. So Lenoptics owned the 51% and VCs that invested in EasyChip got only 49%. And there must have been subsequent rounds. Uh, yeah, yeah, there were a few rounds. Yeah. So the market started with 100%, and then went down to 51, and and then is it cheap? Okay, okay, so you're not going to address culture. Maybe you can go back to Adam and start with him, and then I'll let Dove with a, his scowl on his face when I was making comments about culture, uh, you know, chime in. But how would you have defined the, you know, the Swiss culture? Well, I always ask people, how, yeah, you know, everyone's had a bad girlfriend, bad wife, boyfriend. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. And you've been in a bad relationship, yeah? And you know how bad you are in that situation, how bad for each other you are. And so if you think about the workplace, you actually spend more time in the workplace than any other relationship in life. So if it's a bad place to be, you're not going to be very functional, are you? So for us, understanding that and having an appreciation that we need to create a workplace that's aspirational and compelling to be a part of, that excites people. It's a simple formula, but the lack of organisations that, you know, they'll have a business plan, but they don't have a culture plan. You need to have a culture plan. You need to look after it. It's like one of these plants. If you don't give it some water and some sunlight occasionally, it's going to die. And same with your culture. If you don't invest in it, if you don't, uh, if it's not just, it can't be just words on a wall. It needs to be something that's organic and alive. It's not just a mission statement. Correct. It's called I, I, when anybody ever shows up, to my office and like starts their presentation with a mission statement. I'm so out of there. I'm mean, sorry. I hate to say that. But everyone forgets what their mission statement is. It's got to be something that's alive and organic and thriving. So, how do you build culture? What? <laughs> my belief is what's culture and how to build it is that you should have a dream. And I'm talking to the entrepreneur that in the car. In the car, you should have a dream. You should, you should have a very clear definition of how to reach the dream, and you should be such a believer that everybody in your company, everybody in your company, including the cleaner, whatever, believes with you. And the meaning of it is that you are there, you are there with them 100%. I'll, I'll give you an example. In my analysis steps, and, and probably most of the companies I've been involved with, the, the, the first value is uh, people first. People first can be a statement in the world, but can be very much the way you treat your employees, you treat your investors, you treat your, uh, your customers, you treat your suppliers. Everything around it, every thinking of any activity with anybody, the employees, the partners, the, the customers, comes out of it. Decisions are made because of it, and everybody in the company knows it. That's a very big culture. And the, the meaning later on, I think that they are very basic. And you have to stick to it in order to change culture, by the way, or values every several years. So, how do you build culture at a company like Vroom? Or so, so there's, there's two levels of culture. There's the, the first, first 30 employees and then everybody else. And I think the first 30 is very much about building a sense of family, almost. Um, Deep, deep, deep uh, engagement uh, in the company, in the mission, not the mission statement, <laughs> um, but the, 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 the dream, right? Pursuing a big dream. Um, after 30 employees, it becomes uh, much more difficult because it's, it's a company we're up to. We just passed 500 employees. So, what do you, what do, you do? How do you, how do you, okay, so I know that there's the core 30, and we just passed in our crowd 100. And I feel very much like everybody gets it. We're, we're all together working on this. But I worry about 500. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. You know, there's, 
I was just talking about this recently with a close friend who manages a company with tens of thousands of employees. And there's a metric that they have called employee engagement. So we all worry about our customers and what our customers think of us. Um, my friend told me he spends a lot of time worrying about what the, what the employees think about the company, how engaged they are in the story and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, kind of constantly shooting for high employee engagement in the broad sense of the term is the way to build culture and fundamentally a great company. So if some startup guy out there has to be building an employee engagement software program because we need it. Okay, uh, unless you recommend one that exists, I haven't seen it yet. Look, uh, culture starts with people. But when you build a company, you know, it's obviously important to go get money, to get the 30 key people who sort of believe in the mission, not the statement. Uh, but the biggest issue that I see in my company and in most companies that I back is who do you hire? And how do you build out your management team? And how quick are you to hire? How quick are you to fire those senior managers? Do you look for people who are like you, people who are not like you? So Ellie, you know, you know how, and especially this issue of, like when you go to America, there's an Israeli company, do I hire a US CEO over there? How much of the business do I send over there? These are real questions that I think most entrepreneurs grapple with. How, how did you handle that stuff? Yeah, and that's the key, and uh, I can tell you that in EasyChip, the management team that I have today is the, is the same management team that started the company 16 years ago. Wow, congratulations. And the guy that, uh, that uh, actually I, I took 16 years ago to manage the U.S., he told me afterwards that, you know, he came for a year, a <laughs> quick exit, and he's still with us. So I think that keeping uh, people long term is the key, making them feel part of the company, making them feel part of a family. We give, obviously, uh, uh, RSU's stock to every employee, including the receptionist and the cleaner and everyone. And I'm not talking about small money. They make a lot of money. So, so again, if you can tell me, just for the benefit of the audience, how much did the receptionist or the cleaner make? Without being specific in naming people, but order and act tens of thousands of dollars. They made tens of thousands of dollars on the, on the acquisition. Thank God. Wonderful. Radic, who would you hire? With uh, my show, we've hired people that have great skill, but not necessarily from our industry. Uh, and that's because they, you know, they don't have predisposed ideas about how things should be. So that was really important. The other thing was to ensure that we rewarded people that found other people uh, to work for our organisation. So if you had a bounty for people who would recruit, they'd get a... How much did you get? Oh, it depend on the, 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 the role, but it would be you know, anything from as simple as $1,000 to, to $5,000 for someone. So someone, whether it's a great idea, I'm sure the outright people are going to be talking to you about that soon. But, you know, in other words, people who were bringing in yeah, uh, you know, other employees were getting a, a cash bounty. Exactly, exactly. And, and then, then they, they feel compelled to make sure they work out as well. Yes. You know, <laughs> when they come back, if they get fired in three months, you have to get back. Yes. Well, they don't get it unless they last for six months, yeah? So at the end of that six month period, the cash is paid out and everyone's happy. So who were the key like, hires you needed and you made? How did you get them? Did you, did you hire headhunters or how did you do it? Well, he was just okay, <laughs> but I would say no. Clearly, uh, the most important people that you are going to uh, hire in the company are yourself and the guys who will establish the company with you. And I was very lucky to have great partners for me in the beginning, and I was very lucky to hire more people and more people, change a lot, change not by firing, moving people from one job to another, creating some, uh, some uh, uh, flexibility, uh, in the mood of the people, so if you took job to be your exit uh, manager in two years, making the one responsible for finding the greatest whatever, let's say that job, okay? So change the positions, work with them very close with everybody, as, as much as, as you are still very busy, uh, but put the highest attention into the people rather than to the sales and, and other activities. Uh, there's no other form of So, Ellie, so, you, you act, I think, recently as a, more of an executive chairman or chairman of a company working with the CEO and whatnot. That must be 
real interesting because I know you as an entrepreneur and I know you want to get in there and get your hands dirty and on the other hand the chairman's role is a different role right it's a role where you have to sort of provide guidance and support but let the, the other guy more or less run you know run with the ball and be the quarterback how does that work uh, I think it's the best of both worlds right so you, you get the big title um, you get by these nice panels and everything which, which is good um, and for me, it's all the fun. It's participating in, in all the management meetings. It's the recruiting. It's the financing meetings. I actually don't have to manage anybody anymore, which is a great relief. You don't get calls at 2 in the morning? No, 2, 2 a.m. calls and no weekend calls. Um, it's really being involved in the company building without the really the hardest part, which is the people management. So a lot of companies seem to get their real big inflection point when they make a big distribution deal or a big strategic deal, where someone, I think it was your deal, Elliot, at Cisco, when, when that happened, I mean, they're the, obviously the big dog. Um, how important, obviously it was very important, how hard was it to get that deal? Did that take years? What were the big obstacles? What did you have to give up? You know, a lot of people are scared of those deals. They feel they're, uh, for example, what they call constructive, acquisition where they basically acquired you without having acquired you. How yeah. do you approach this thing? Yeah, yeah it, in, in our case it was a three-way deal with uh, Cisco and Malvel. Cisco, we approached them to use our chips, we had great technology, they loved it, but they told us, look, we cannot buy from you, you are too small, too risky, go find a big brother. So we went uh, to Marvel, which we knew, and they became the big brother. They manufactured, sold to Cisco, we collected the royalty, and it went on for 10 years. Everyone was very happy, three generations of uh, chips. And for us, it, it was the really key strategic deal because the company uh, was able to maintain gross margins of 85% and net margin, net profit of 50% for a semiconductor company, which is pretty amazing. So, so that, that was really a very important step. Yeah, that was a fundamental deal. Right? Why did you have a single deal that really defined the company and you know, catapulted you forward? For sure, ours was a, a failure that suddenly became a success. So we launched in the USA. Uh, it's a huge amount of fanfare with, um, with uh, Alan and the talk show, and, and we had uh, Nicole Kidman as an Alan and Alan Yes, yeah, yeah, so we brought it to Australia, and, and we did the show over in Australia, and we, we sponsored a whole season. And it got us selling in the US, but we, we ran out of cash fast. We, we'd underprepared cash-wise for the US. Uh, but, so we retreated back to Australia and quickly got ourselves into turnaround mode, but as a result of all the noise we made, suddenly we'd become the biggest selling vitamin brand in China online, so, uh, and so they work fake. Yeah, well, exactly. So, you know, looking for high quality nutritional supplements and the noise we made captured the attention and um, from then on, you know, we've, we've, we've uh, gone on with forward. Dove, was there one big huge deal before the acquisition? Well, uh, generally, when you said beautiful law, it's not uh, my customer, it's uh, the way I think uh, hundreds of customers all together. But maybe I can point you to one great partnership we had, uh, which was with uh, Toshiba. Amazing company, great people, amazing people. Uh, Japanese, in a very, very good sense of, of being Japanese, loyal, honest. Uh, and we created over the years an amazing partnership that really was a true win win to both companies. Now, to do it, created, it's a matter of many years of efforts, uh, getting to know the guys very well, doing a lot of, uh, of uh, alcohol together, yeah. part of life, and, uh, and that's the fun part of life. We very honest and, uh, and uh, really try to look at it, not just uh, how can I make more, it's, an, it's, it's a really great win. It's so important you said that, because so many people think that these deals sort of happen you know, instantly. Because we're in the startup culture where, where weeks, not years. But these big deals often take that kind of time. Because your experience that way? So I'm actually, uh, I'm, there's no plenty of drinking and deal making. That's, uh, I had that experience. But, uh, and, and now you own your own winery, so you can supply Adam and very good wine, by the way. Bot Shlomo, if you 
you find the bottle, which is not available almost anywhere. Last night, or two nights ago, we had dinner, and I found one, and brought it to the table to our uh, guests from Singapore. And I said, this is really great, and they said, get more, if there was no more to be had. I got two advertisements in one panel, it's very good. Um, I would say, as a consumer internet company right now, uh, it's a slightly different playing field. And, you know, our destiny is determined by our ability to master the distribution channel, which is much less dependent on, uh, on partnerships and much more dependent on our ability to actually go out and acquire customers directly. And so, slightly different playing field. I've done many of deals in the past which, which have driven my businesses. But um, being in the consumer internet business really depends on mastering your own destiny. Okay, I'm asking. Go ahead. Maybe just an issue that we should use the bulletin to, to stick. Uh, when you go to get a strategic partner, with, as I mentioned, it's a lot of work and, 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 and alcohol and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and dinners and flying back and forth and uh, seeing people. But the most important stuff, let's not forget it for a minute, is that you really bring a true value. Because if you try to create relations with uh, Shiba or Samsung, or any company, wherever it is, and you don't have the value, they, you can spend as much time flying there weekly. It won't help you. You need to bring a true value that would really make them enjoy uh, of their relations. And uh, it's not that everybody brings a value. Some people don't, or some people bring a value which is not so important to your strategic partner. So find, create value, find the right partners that can utilize this value. Okay, we've got time for one more question, which is one that interests me personally. So you guys have all done very well. You've all built, you know, either billion or multi-billion dollar companies. Are you still hungry? And if you're hungry, what are you going to do differently this time around? Are you moving on to a different phase of life, being more of an investor, kicking back a little bit? And we won't start with Ellie, she just sold this company, you know. We will end with you. We'll start with uh, Ellie on, on, on this side. Okay, so, yeah, still very hungry. Uh, there's something exciting, personally, building big companies. I think it's, it's going from bigger scales to even bigger scales. So, Vroom is in the, in the oil and space in the U.S. It's a $500 million industry. We did an acquisition. We're, we're close to a billion dollars in revenues this year. Uh, the opportunity to build something which potentially and realistically could be five, ten, fifteen billion dollars in revenue is uh, is a new milestone which uh, which has had to achieve. And uh, stay tuned. I look, I look forward to drinking to that. Okay, so are you still hungry? Hey, come on. <laughs> uh, I just made a short short story. I went to ten years ago to Victor Van Horvitz, and uh, you know, uh, Mr. Horvitz. Um, and uh, actually, he defined us as a twin brothers, twin brothers because it seems like we copy each other every stage in our life in a way which is unbelievable, really unbelievable. He sold his company at the end of the year, of 2007, $1.5 million. We, end of 2006, $1.6 million. He established a fund, I established a fund. He wrote the book, I wrote the book. In his book, every chapter begins in a quote from a song, my book, which I Right before I read this, every chapter begins with a, with a quote from a, from a, a song. Uh, and I ask him this question because it was important to me to look at his eyes and ask this question. And we found that we have exactly the same answer I could. The same answer is wall to wall by what he said. He said, I didn't have money. Money is, is an issue, but it's not the issue. But I got so much data, experience. Uh, the scars on my, on my back, uh, so much knowledge relations uh, that I want to start doing it in the next company. I want to spread it over many companies. This is what, what I'm doing. And I said, wow. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, hey, look, yeah, I'm going to really 80 years old. The vitamins have been fantastic, so it's time to retire. <laughs> Uh, in all seriousness, uh, it's, it's just such a relief to, um, to, to go beyond now just carrying the debt and uh, be in a privileged position where I can truly, uh, you know, I, I know my, my business makes it all a better place, but now I can really start the engines up, so really looking forward to the next few decades. Great. Ellie? 
the most huge man on the market. Yeah, I had a long fight with the activist investors, so it was really, you know, I had a tough few months. So I have to rest at least a week. <laughs> and then the question, are you going, am I going to be an investor or an entrepreneur? And that reminds me of the story that one of my first investors told me. You know, when you go to an investor and ask him to build a company together, it's, he, he told me, it's like building ham and eggs business. You want the investor to give the ham and you want to give the eggs yourself. So, I don't know. It's a really good analogy for I don't know, if I, want, I don't want, I don't know, you know, in which side I want to be. <laughs> well, with that, Wonderful uh, analogy and story. Thank you guys to the two Ellie's, to Radek, to Dove. You had a great panel, and we're going to move on. Thank you very much.